This is being recorded to the cloud. This is our 795 in the spring of 2023. We have eight students in this class or learners or participants, four being PhD, four being EDD. I think we have four males and four females, but we have two males and six females maybe, I don't know. We also have two guests, one who recently received her PhD from Indiana University and dedicated to her grandfather and her son. Uh, and so Sihang is back with us. She was in my class on Sunday, my R511 class. So uh, I thank you for coming twice. And Sunday was also in my R511 class in week one. So she's helped me out twice, two weeks in a row. Both of them helped me out twice now. So that's great. Um, and soon they will have the perspective of the EDD students. So we can hear from a PhD and an EDD. They both have slides for us. I'm going to present on my tips for defending a dissertation and rewriting a dissertation after break. But before that, I want us to hear from Sunmei and from Zihang. Um, before we hear from si, uh, Zihang and Sunmei, I wonder if all the students in this class, Tina, Jake, Tofik, Heijong, Paula, Barbara, have questions for either of them before we start. Maybe you could tell them a bit about where you're at in the process of writing a proposal. Are you at the first sentence stage? at the first paragraph stage? Are you at the first page stage or at the 20 page stage or beyond? Are you really just starting to think or do you have something written down? We'll start with Barbara and work our way around. Barbara, have you started it all on it? Um, so I actually took a course last semester on evaluation methods um, with Dr. Rakowski. So we had to write a evaluation proposal in that class. So I've used that to sort of start working on a proposal idea. And um, you and are an EDD student? Yes. Okay. So yes. just at the beginning stages, using your class work to think about restructuring that. Tofik? Yes. Tofik? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I uh, thank you, Dr. Bang. I I just actually finished my first author study. I did study in uh, gamified learning. <laughs> uh, to be quite honest, for the stage of dissertations, uh, I'm currently looking for the topics, but my interest would be still related to my first author study about gamified learning. And so you're defending first author study this end of this month. Hopefully, it's going to be 27. Okay. Yeah. okay. So you're still at beginning stages then. Jake, are you in the same boat? Yeah, I'm still in the very beginning stages, yes. Okay. okay. So we have two PhD students who are in the same boat together. Uh, the boat is not a big boat. Hey, Zhang, are you in that boat or are you in a different boat? I am in the same boat. <laughs> very okay. beginning stage. So you all had Dr. O last semester. For yeah. six nine five. Okay. Uh, to is it Tofik or Taufik? Oh, it's Taufik, the second one, the later. Taufik. I didn't have you in class, did I? First time. This is okay. Okay. There was another student with a similar name, I think, for a while. That's uh, why I got confused. Okay. So I've not had Jake or Heijong or Tofik, even though they're uh, sitting around in Bloomington. I haven't really had a chance to meet. And Barbara. You and Tina and Paul are all EDD students. Um, Tina, I know very well because she was a guest in my class last semester and been a student in my class several times. Paula, I know very well because she's my advisee. Um, Paula, um, where are you at with your proposal? I'm at the beginning stages. Okay. And um, Barbara, again, where do you live? Okay, there we go. Um, up in Laporte, so right outside South Bend, about 30 minutes west of there. You're an Indiana North person, and Tina's an Indiana South person, right, Tina? Yes, about 45 minutes from you all. Okay, and you're in Greene County, uh, in Bloomfield? Uh, Bloomfield? Yeah, Bloomfield. Yeah, 
Right. And Paul is not in Indiana. Paul, you uh, you may be not even in the USA. Paul, you want to tell people where you're at? I'm in St. John, New Brunswick, Canada. So we have one Canadian with us, uh, at least. It's good to have you, Paula. Tina, where are you at with your proposal? Still in the beginning stages. I have some okay. kernels of ideas popping around. Okay, and, and Tina's involved in maker spaces in Greene County mm -hmm. with, with adolescents. So Zihang and Sunei, now you have a sense of where they're at. There's no one who's near the end, uh, like Sunmi is right now analyzing data. She is nearing the end, or Zihang who reached the ending point and is gainfully employed full time and was before that. Um, so Sunmei and Sihong will have different pieces of advice for you tonight. Um, and the, the other day in, five, in my 511 class, we went back and forth between the two guests in, uh, and Yua Ma is here who took the class last semester. So it's, it's good to have Yua join. Welcome Yua. Um, and Yua, you want to tell people where you're at with your proposal? Oh, sure. I am still kind of writing my proposal right now and um, I'm still revising some parts. Um, so I talked to my advisor, which is Dr. Brush, and um, he said, just send me whatever you have and then he will start working on that and then yeah. we'll move from there. So if you think about drawing a line in the state of Indiana, we would have Tina and then we kind of go east to get Jake and Tofik, Tofik and to get uh, Heijong, and then we keep going up and we get Barbara and we keep going a little north of Barbara. She's over in Laporte and we get Yua in Chicago. And now Yua is not enrolled in the classes. She was enrolled last semester, but thinks that she can learn a bit from um, our guests every week. So that's great to have Yua back in some structure too. Um, we may have another person who sounds similar name to Yua, Yua Chin Ma, my advisee may join us as well on certain weeks. She's been working on a proposal for a long time and maybe changing her topic. And so um, she would like to sit in uh, on different weeks in here. And we also have a person named Karen Fortune from the University of Houston who sat in last semester who's gonna sit in certain weeks this semester as well. So we have a few guests in here. Um, Sune, Sihong, we didn't chat ahead of time of who would go first. Um, do you have a preference for either of you? Um, I <clears throat> actually uh, went through uh, Sumi's uh, slides you shared <laughs> this morning. Right. So I think her um, her slides um, focus on EDD, on the core exam, and also yeah, some like a uh, procedures. Uh, so it's kind of very. Uh, like a step-by-step -step guide. And then, um, so my my part, uh, my slides focus more on writing part. Okay. Uh, like so my part, yeah. Yeah, yeah, kind of part of your, right. your, your session, uh, your section. So uh, I will share with you some strategies and some suggestions. So, um, I don't know. I don't have any preference. So Sumi can start maybe share with students the procedures or, you know, the. So yeah, here's what we'll do. Sumi will present a slide or two, and me and you will both comment on that uh, <laughs> and add to it from a more of a PhD perspective. So she'll be talking from an EDD perspective, and then you and I, Zihang, will can, can add to what she's saying, and then we'll move to your slides, and then we'll move to my slides. Okay. Um, so Sune is located okay. in, as, as you all know, maybe she's in Palo Alto, working at Stanford, creating apps, um, math, mathematic related, uh, well, whatever Stanford wants her to do, but she also worked for an educational technology firm, has been working for a technology firm in Berkeley, which created something called Todo to -do Math. math. Total math is a M name, and then you know company name is Enuma. Yeah. Enuma, yeah. Uh, and so you want to take over Sune at this point? Sune's been my TA four times, mm -hmm. I think, in the past two years. So 
she's almost in control. Um, uh, she should be listed <laughs> as a professor now, um, <laughs> even though she's not done yet. <laughs> <Don't say that. laughs> okay, yeah, the first of all, you know, I don't know nowadays, my internet is not stable. So I think that maybe be storm problem but finally storm is gone so hopefully today it will go well i hopefully and then it doesn't work maybe i can use my phone okay and sometimes i will turn off my video that's because i want to make it smoothly okay okay can you see that yes we can okay Okay, can you see that? Yes. Okay. And your video is better than the other day. It's not perfect. You don't have yeah. the little, but it's it's really good. It's really good. It's, you know, um, yeah. The yeah. The, so okay. The storm okay, has left. Then, maybe <laughs> finally. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. So let me go first. Actually. As you know, Chao said that maybe I will cover the EDD part. That's because I think that this course covers actually qualifying exam and dissertation proposal for EDD student. So I think that maybe qualifying exam part is not for PhD, but you can understand what is going on with EDD student, right? And a lot of what you say will apply to PhD students. I've looked at her slides. But there are a couple that will be specific to EDD. Just if you're a PhD student, yeah. you'll just have to be patient. And it's towards the middle, she'll be covering the EDD quals. Go ahead. Yeah. So the first of all, I really want to say congratulations, you know, at the final stage for graduation. So I really want to, you know, say. And then, but I think definitely you feel, you know, just confusing and afraid and nervous. That's because I did exactly one year ago. <laughs> and don't worry, I can share my experience and tips I learned. So don't worry, okay? Just listen to the step by step. And later, if you have a question, just email me or whatever you have just to ask me, okay? So actually, you are supposed to do following taking this course. So First one is take a qualifying exam for EDD student. The second one is work on dissertation proposal for both students. And after this course, you do the following. So you have to submit the doctoral candidate's form. So I don't know, it's the same thing to the PhD as well? Yes, same right? thing. Same thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I want to check. That's because, but at that time, you have to complete all coursework except for R799, okay? And then you can submit it. That's because for my case, I didn't finish all coursework, so I have to delay that form. So it is really different from everyone. So you have to check. And then finish your dissertation proposal with your advisor and schedule your dissertation proposal defense ASAP. That's because usually during the summer, it's really hard to schedule. So actually I had a hard time, but Dr. Bong actually made, made it happen. So actually I did during summer, but usually no. So after summer, usually other peers actually had, you know, defense. And then just to start to IRB form, whatever, you know, after this course. That's because I highly recommend that before having a defense, you have to submit it. And then maybe you will get several revisions from that, you know, that center, but it's okay. Finally, you can do it. So for me, actually, it took two weeks. So it was really quickly. That's because I submitted and then I did right away and two times and then I got approval. That's because I thought that usually it takes one month or sometimes two or three months, but this time I really wanted to, you know, get the approval before having my defense, so it worked. And then have a dissertation proposal defense, and then you have to pass, and then the finally you have to submit the dissertation proposal approval form. 
But actually, you know, actually I didn't know about that the last two, two part before. But actually after finishing the defense and then I realized that, oh, I'm supposed to do that. But actually those guidelines, actually the document, so you can check the your click link and then there is some portal and then there are a lot of document. And then there is one document is a kind of a checklist for EDD students. So you can check that one and then you can, you know, so you will know that what is the process. But before taking this course, I didn't know about that. So I have to, you know, explore every site and then what I should do. But after finishing every part, I just to realize that uh, there are certain steps, but sometimes there is no step. Okay, so everyone is at different status. So you have to check your status and then make it happen. Okay. Let me and pause you there. Why don't you, why don't you go back a slide? And I want to see if um, Zi Hung wants to add anything there. Okay. <laughs> no, it's just like some procedures. I think, yeah, Sami already covered uh, everything. Okay. I'll add three things. One, mm -hmm. in Dropbox, I've put Sunme slides. So if you have the Dropbox link, and you, I think you can find it in the syllabus and Karen, um, or I can send it again. So her slides are there. And the second thing I want to mention is that I have a roster that I put in Canvas. I haven't sent it to, to Karen or you. I haven't sent it to, um, so I, before you arrived, I mentioned that there's gonna be a few people sitting in. We'll have a third person, one of my advisees, her name's Yua Chen Ma, might also sit in some weeks. So we have eight enrolled, four PhD, three EDD, and three people sitting in. We might get more than that um, sitting in this class. And there are times when we have a special guest, like in two weeks, we have Alyssa Wise coming. I may ad invite other doctoral students if they want to listen to her. So there may be other people coming in when Dr. Hitchcock comes back and talks about mixed methods, mm -hmm. when Vanessa Denon comes and talks about um, systematic reviews of the research. There may be more people in here, just, just so people are aware of that. Um, and so I will post a new roster uh, to Canvas, but I'll send it to all of you on email and maybe I should put it in Dropbox. So that's the second thing. And the third thing um, is your advisor can help you negotiate the defense state and the proposal defense and actual defense states. And so summer is difficult for some faculty. I work mm -hmm. typically through the summer and am willing to serve. If you want to defend in the summer, talk to your advisor about who are the faculty that are around in the summer typically, and who are the ones that are overseas. We have some, at least one that goes overseas, has gone to another, and, and, and really hard to get a hold of. So, you know, organize that with your instructor. If you really get nervous about trying to defend in the summer, don't put the people on the committee that won't be around in the summer. It's as simple as that. Um, fourth, while this looks logical, everything's logical, you know, the staff in any university, whether you're here or like Karen at Houston, University of Houston, they're all, they all create these forms. The faculty member will not, your faculty members will not memorize all this. I've been on 125 dissertations and every time it's a new experience. <laughs> There's something I learned that's new. So we do not know all the answers. So try and look it up, you know, find out what you can about when you have to, for instance, you have to advertise your dissertation a month in advance. It has to be, um, especially for the PhD students, you have to have it listed in I, Indiana University's graduate announcements. It's got to be announced. And you have to give faculty a month to read the dissertation you're supposed to ahead of time. So there's certain things that we, you know, we try and abide by. Um, typically, you're supposed to, after your defense, you're supposed to have six months before you can defend it. There are exceptions made for that so that you can defend before six months. Uh, and so while there are rules, there are exceptions to rules. Uh, while there are forms, <laughs> don't expect, be, just because we've filled up the form 100 times before, that we know every one of the forms Try and you know track them down on your own and and seek out your advisor's advice on the form side only you know uh, when you have to um, try and tackle all those issues on your own where possible, uh, but do it, get your advisor's advice about 
who's best in working together? Who are good people that, that tend to tend to typically, or if you're focused on higher education study, who are the higher education faculty? If you're a K-12 person, who are the K-12 faculty? You know, um, so find find that out. So there are a lot of things, even though this looks logical, there's a lot of stuff in the background that you have to consider. Um, and, you know, I just want to point that out. Soon maybe you can keep going. Uh, maybe, we, actually, maybe we should I... stop if there's any questions. Anyone have a question on any of that? I want to add one more thing. Actually, as for the you know order presentation for EDD, at the time we need two committee member, but for proposal defense we need three committee member. So different. So you have to keep in mind that. Yes, and PhD you need five, four committee members, and where I went to grad school at Wisconsin we needed five committee members. So. And, oh and if you have an external member, which you can have, it's every once in a while, we have a, a member from another campus, that's an extra in addition to three members as an EDD, in addition to four members as a PhD student. As an external person can provide some expertise that no one else on the committee has. Go ahead. So is it the same for PhD? So. P PhD is one more person. You have to have four. One more person, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. So let me explain a little bit detail about EDD qualifying exam. That's because usually before the maybe professor in charge, at the time, Dr. Borshiba now changed, right? Because I'm not sure who is in charge Dr. right now. Dr. Kwan this and year. Oh, okay, Dr. Kwan. Okay, so Dr. Kwan maybe will explain some information about that, but I think that definitely it's not hard, you know, not easy to understand. That's because usually that part is administrator's part, but this part is from the test taker's part. So actually I understand that's because I, you know, went through and then I summarize what is that, okay? And the first of all, that one is a two day exam and now is online. Actually before it's in person, but after COVID-19, it was changed into online and day one and day two. So day one is actually written test and two writing. So we are supposed to write a paper and for three and a half hour per each paper. And then there is one hour, 20 minute break. And day two is oral presentation. So usually six weeks before we are supposed to, you know, create some answer, you know, comedy questions, comedy questions. So we can develop and then we can submit them to the our advisor. And then we finalize. And then two weeks before we will get. No, 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 six weeks before we get the, you know, finalize the questions and then we have to finish the answer. So actually we have to submit that at least two weeks before, right? And then the day two, we have to give a presentation about our answer. So usually presentation length is 15 to 20 minutes but not very long, but usually after then we will get the feedback and then committee member will decide, you know, pass, fail, and then maybe revisions, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, so that's because I thought they usually just pass and fail, but sometimes a little bit, you know, minor revision, so that's it. And day one written exam. So usually many EDD students are really afraid of taking this test. That's because, you know, just writing test and then kind of a stressful time just for three and a half and we are supposed to write something right and then submit it but luckily there is you know confirmed you know question set so actually three types of question the first question is always analysis skill so usually article critique so usually we did a lot of times taking you know multiple courses. That's because I found some paper I did before, you know, so you can refer to your paper. The question two is research skill, but actually there are two different types. So every year we are not sure which types of questions. My case actually evaluation plan, but other years usually current research. 
So you have to study three different types of exam I, topics, I think. So day one written exam, usually you will get the test schedule before. I'm not sure how much, maybe one month or two weeks ago, exactly same, to, just to write table. So my name is just the bottom part and then really, really detailed. So actually it's just to asynchronous test, you know? There is no supervisor, just I, I do that. So for my case, I'm in California. So really different time zones. So it's really early for my case. So actually I requested to rescheduling time for me. So my name is just last, that's because my time is different. So at the time I did 10.50 in IU time, but at my time it is 7.50. So we will get the you know, first question exactly 10.15, 10.50, and then we will work on three and a half, and then we are supposed to submit it 2.30. And after then we have some break, and then question two actually, uh, I got the 3.50. So exact schedule, so you have to check. And then you think that, oh, it's really only for me, at that time you have to reschedule, okay? So actually I did. So, so the first of all, on that day, you will get the email, the 750, and then you are supposed to write a one paper and then you have to return your answer to the professor in charge is Dr. Wong. And then Dr. Wong will send the confirmation email. So you have to stay in the, you know, in front of a computer until get the, you know, getting the confirmation email and then you can go. Okay, and then you will have a break time in the same way. And detail, so you can use any available resources. So it's like an open book test. You can use internet or, you know, any resources, you know, any learning material you have, you can use that one. Also, they recommend just to Microsoft Word for answer, no PDF, you know, just MS Word. And then if you need to ask for rescheduling, and then this exam will be notified via email around three weeks later. So for my case, three weeks later. So usually pass or fail and maybe revision. So day two is order presentation. So before order presentation, you have to develop questions regarding your dissertation topic and then send them to your advisor and then you are advisor and you know other committee member the so finalize and then finalize the questions will be you know sent to you and then you you have one month to work on it and then you have to give a presentation so usually writing writing length is maybe right now is different right so my time is 2500 words but is is that true say Dr. Four, 4000 Okay, yeah, maybe change it. And then send them to the advisor committee two weeks in advance and make a presentation document. So actually I think that day two is not very difficult. That's because it's related to your research topic. So it's okay. It's a kind of any initiation of your research, you know, dissertation, that's okay. But usually day one is a little bit, you know, concern for many EDD students, I think, right? And then the oral presentation is the same thing. So I highly recommend just to enter earlier and then present your response for 10 to 15 minutes and answer the question by the committee member. That's because usually they ask the many questions and then wait in the waiting room and then come back and listen to their feedback. So usually result is a pass to revision and fail. And then how to prepare for EDD, the first one, yeah, first day. So for my case, actually, I created a study group. That's because I felt really isolated from other people. That's because I'm online student. And then I didn't get enough, you know, enough information about this test. So actually, I emailed some of my peers. Can you join my study group? So we are a total of four people. And then we created a Google Drive group folder and then share whatever we have 
just unloaded all resources. And we meet regularly, usually bi-weekly, and then review all the ISD classes together. Mm -hmm. That's because there are many classes. I took 20 or 21 classes. And then some are not eligible for this test, but mostly maybe over 10 classes are you know eligible courses. But we can do that by myself, right? By ourselves, it's a lot. So actually we divide it into four people and then we will go, you know, and then we share. So we have to study this point, this point. It's a kind of a collaboration and then do brainstorming for three question types. So review others practice writing and share feedback. At that time, there are some, you know, practice tests, but usually we didn't get feedback earlier. So it's really hard. So anyway, we actually work and then we share our writing and then we just give you know feedback to other students you know writing so that that was really helpful i think and then there are three types of question types so actually for me i created a template so article critique current research evaluation plan just as something like that so it's just you know title introduction literature review something like that and then I created a template per each type. So actually I created three different two templates. And then search for the model paper for three types of paper. You know, actually I can share that one, but I don't recommend to use that one. That's because of plagiarism. So I highly recommend just to you search for the model paper. You know, there are tons of really good paper and then develop your own template. That is the best way, I think. And then collect the article resources. That's because usually, you know, we need to cite some, you know, other paper or article, but it's really hard to, you know, search for article during the exam. That's because three and a half hour, it's really long, right? But actually not long. It's really short, you know, just write and then just quickly passed. So I highly recommend you think that kind of develop, create some list of top topic, you know? So that one is actually my topic I did. So collaborative learning, gamification, mobile learning, personalized learning. So actually I shared that link. So you can, you know, check that link as well. And they created the list and then created the, you know, citation, you know, format in advance. So whatever you work, oh, I needed that article at the time, just a copy and paste, and then you can save time, okay? And then highly recommend you read every article. Maybe you can summarize something, at least the keyword. You don't need to make a really long sentences, a long tacky, just the key, you know, key sentences or keyword, it's okay. Actually for me, I didn't do that. So I just added or highlighted some, you know, highlighted some keyword every article, and then I use that. And then try to take many practice questions. So at the time, there are two, you know, exams. So I did, and then especially I did exactly the same situation. Some students just to, you know, read and then try and then just to finish, but that's not exactly test. That's because after taking the first two practice question, I realized that three and a half is not really long. That's because the first trial, not enough. So I didn't finish the question. So I realized that and then, you know, oh, I have to make a kind of a plan. So first of all, five to 10 minutes read the instruction and then maybe one more five minute and make a brainstorming and then work maybe two and a half hours and then at least 30 minutes I have to do proofreading, something like this. So I make a, some procedure of, you know, of this test and then I can make it. So usually seven or eight pages, I think, at least to, over five pages. Under five pages is not enough, I think. Do you have any question? Is it something? 
And then next one is a dissertation proposal. So maybe Chao will join, right? So, so let me let me interrupt on the, that and just say, yeah. Therese came last week, and her templates are in Dropbox. So if you would like the EDD students would like some templates, they're in there. I could put Sunmei's templates in if she sends them to me, so you can have some example templates. Second, one person, and maybe it was Sunmei, said they read every article in Tech Trends to get ready for quals. I don't know, maybe it wasn't you, Sunmei, but the the qualifying exam for EDD students, the, the article critique is nine times out of 10 comes from Tech Trends. <laughs> yeah. Almost 100%, not quite. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> The third thing is my computer is finally fixed, my desktop. So I have a chance. I've been catching up, playing catch up. Yesterday, I finally got my computer back after almost two weeks. So I apologize. I'm a little behind uh, in in the the practice quals for the EDD students. They're not set up in Canvas yet. So if you've been mm -hmm. looking to take the practice quals, I doubt if anyone was trying to take them, but soon they will remind me after class to try and set that up. Uh, it was a little tricky. I, I, I almost did it, but then I was worried I was going to overwrite the whole course. So I just stopped myself from doing that. So I, I'm going to try and contact someone, maybe um, tech support to help me do move them from last semester to this semester. Uh, the, the next thing is um, PhD students. This is similar to dossier two process in that you get like, I don't know, like 15 minutes to present. You might get more, you might get a little less. And then people ask questions. There are two people that read your file. They're assigned uh, to, to read and critique and ask you questions. Those two faculty will ask you questions first, then all the faculty, and then all the students. And then after about 20 minutes or half hour of that, I, again, I don't know the exact time. You probably already do. We go and discuss it in a private room to see whether you pass or fail or have revisions. I would say more often you would have revisions than fail. Failure happens once in a while. Um, I've seen it in, in both the EDD and PhD programs, but it doesn't happen often. More like you, it's a revisionary thing. Uh, recently, I've seen a lot of people pass without revising. I saw two people in dossier two last time pass without any revisions, and everybody in the EDD passed without revisions at all. So. Uh, things are looking up. That's not the norm, um, but I, I will say that. Um, the paper for the EDD students, the comprehensive paper or committee question is 4,000 words. It used to be 2,500. Mm -hmm. They keep increasing it. And forming study groups does help um, in either case. The, the, the students created a study group last time and actually liked each other so well um, they keep talking to each other, forming, you know, they keep working together. In fact, they created, they have a, created a coffee cup with the students' names on for me from the class last semester. <laughs> um, and so <laughs> I'll bring that cup up through, after break time so you can see it. Um, so anyways, uh, Sunme, you want to keep going with what you were presenting? Or um, uh, Sihong, did you have anything to add about dossier, the PhD qualifying exam? Oh, I just want to say it feels like the the ADD exam, the core exam, it seems like very hard. <laughs> um, yeah, I never actually I didn't know, um, you know, ADD core exam is like this. Uh, I, I was in the PhD program and then, you know, the dossier like the second and the third one and then oral presentation something like that and then this EDD program the core exam is is totally different from that so yeah well the EDD program is what the PhD used to look like yeah I, I knew that <laughs> yeah before you were into the program it used to be like what the EDDs have now and I prefer that I don't like the dossier process I think the <laughs> dossier is harder than the than the EDD. My personal opinion, because um, yeah, everyone uh, is in the room staring at you while you present it. Um, oh my gosh, I I I can still remember that that moment. You, I, <laughs> yeah, it's not in my nightmare, but I I I I can still see that moment. I was there in the room, and then all the faculty members, and then the other um, peers, and then you know in the PhD program were there. And then they were taking turns to ask questions, and then you have to, 
you know, defend your, your stuff and then defend yourself. And then, um, yeah, that's just, oh my gosh, it's, it just feels like, a, okay, maybe if now I, 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 I start it again. I'm not sure whether I could have passed it. It just feels like it's getting harder and harder. So if you're in a PhD program and you do have a quals like this, I would recommend dressing well. I would recommend getting there early, testing out the equipment, walking through the room and introducing yourself to the people in the room so you don't so you're not so nervous when it comes time to present. I should say, you know, even or bring something with, bring donuts or bring um you know, berries, something nutritious, uh, and, you know, just kind of pass that around a little bit, just kind of make the ambiance so not so formalistic and not so stark uh, in that, you know, it's, it's not you versus the audience, it's you with the audience, if you will. Um, make it more of a community feel wherever you can find that. Um, and bring your friends, you know, you, anyone can attend. If they got a couple of students that you work with a lot, tell them, to, ask them if they can come to the to the, the defense. And so you can have your support people with you if you need someone to help keep track of time and how much time it's taken you. Uh, if you, you know, to let you know when one minute is left and two minutes are left, that your, your helpers can really help reduce the tension. Sunme, you wanna continue? Uh, yeah, actually, I want to add one more. So Dr. Bong could point out really good thing, you know, just to take a trend. Usually the papers are under 10 page. So that's the reason I think, and that's because it covers, you know, latest trends and also not too long. So don't worry about the usually seven or eight pages. So as for the article critic, so you are supposed to read that article you know, the first, and after then you have to, you know, critique. Here is my point, actually, you have to read at least two times. So I highly recommend that the first time just to roughly, you know, read. So usually focus on abstract and conclusion. And the second time you have to read, read you know, entire paper really clearly. And then I highly recommend, actually, for my case, I print out that's because I'm really old person. So I really want to highlight and keep point. And then I can do that. That's because it, right now it's online. So we can do that. So the print is out there. So I print out and then highlight and then I worked on it. So maybe you can take my tips, you know, for you. Okay. And then as for the writing dissertation proposal. So after this course, I think that but I highly recommend, but already passed, but you know, actually for me, I started to collect two article related to my dissertation topic. And so just to collect as many as possible, and especially latest, you know, sometimes we need old one, but usually latest one is better. That's because the latest one already contained the old one. So I don't need to do that, right? So usually in my case, you know, collect many article and then usually read abstract and then sometimes just throw it away and then keep it, you know, something like that. And then sometimes really good article and then reference list, I check the reference list and then I collect more article from that list. It's another kit, okay? And then usually filtering latest peer review, English, and accessible to the full text. That's because I don't know, sometimes uh, some article I have to buy it and then it's over $30. So I don't want it. So usually highly recommend just to accessible to the full text. And also I recommend check the number of ci citations. So usually just, you know, I show the one picture and that one is uh, 1,325. So it's really good article. That's because many, you know, people cited this article. So usually I did. Maybe you have a better idea. Dr. Bong, do you have any more tips to search for article? I'm always on the lookout for new articles and what I do when I find them as I make a, 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 a I have a, a, a file mm -hmm. folder system called articles to read and by, and I have mm -hmm. articles by different topics. And I have to get a lot of articles like right now, chat GPT, lots of articles. 
Uh, and so I, and then I'll start putting them in by year, 2021, 22, 23. Right. And then, you know, when I want to go back through and learn about that. I, you know, so I have a file folder for a augmented reality, virtual reality, school mm -hmm. reform, whatever I've all. And then I also have a PowerPoint slide deck and I take a snapshot of the article with a URL and the date, if it's an important mm -hmm. article that I might share with other people. And then I do share articles. I mean, I have multiple things that I do to keep track. Um, but I don't use specialized fancy tools <laughs> like many of you. I don't use EndNote. <laughs> I don't, you know, I use my brain. I don't use EndNote. I just know when I've cited it before. And I, so yeah, I mean, I, I probably should use some of those fancier tools like you all, but I used to use PowerPoint and Word, sometimes Excel, and I pretty much can keep track of most things that way. And then Dropbox. You know, if I have a lot of articles on a certain topic that I want to share, I use Dropbox a lot. Yeah. See, Hong, how I think, about you? Yeah. Um, when I was uh, in the PhD program, program I uh, I joined the workshops uh, offered by the graduate school, I think, the university graduate school. And then they were talking about uh, the two, I, I think everybody already know that, the two reference uh, management uh, tools. One is EndNote, another one is called uh, Zotero. Me Mendeley is another one, I think, right? Or yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, you could uh, um, just uh, uh, go to University Graduate School website. They uh, often offer um, dissertation writing workshops. Like for this mm -hmm. one, is the it's about mm -hmm. reference management tools, and then they also have workshops on dissertation writing, time management, or um, some you know related mental problem uh, related topics uh, for uh, PhD students. So I think it's very helpful, and it's free. Yeah. Oh, is it free? Yeah, that's because I try try to use a different, you know, software for, you know, reference management. But actually, I did, you know, 100 article at the time they requested to pay for that, you know, so no more 100 article. And then oh. I just gave up. Oh, my God, you know, I don't want to, you know, pay monthly. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, that's it. And then just I'm an old, old person. So it's okay, still okay, you know, it, it works, I think. But maybe, you know, just the young people like it to use the tool, but usually free version is limited, I think. So after, you know, some part, and then they have to, you know, buy it, maybe subscription or monthly pay or one-time pay something. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah but, um, I um uh, I mean IU offers a lot of free mm. tools like Adobe mm. products like Microsoft and then, mm. you know there are a lot so uh student can always go to I uh go to IU anywhere yeah it's called IU anywhere um and mm. then uh, let me type here I yeah yeah that's good any, yeah anywhere sure. I think that's the yeah ah. so. Uh, yeah, student can actually uh, get mm -hmm. uh, free access to tons of software and applications. That's uh, good. Yeah, yeah, with the IU credentials. Oh, Barbara, do you have a question? Oh, I was just going to uh, make a comment. So, Sumi, you mentioned looking for articles and paying for some of them. I know if you are looking for an article and we don't necessarily have direct access to it through the library, you can request and um, through that through the library or reach out to the librarians because I've done that in the past and mm -hmm. they're able to get almost anything mm -hmm. one way or another and at no cost. So that's good. There, there is you. another way to get things at no cost and that's to have a lot of friends. I don't have other, that many friends <laughs> at, at, at other universities. <laughs> yes. So I'm constantly writing to other people and saying, do you have access? Do you have access? Can you send me? And then writing to the author directly. Often I'll write to the author directly and many people do. They'll go through ResearchGate or academia.edu, particular mm -hmm. ResearchGate might be a way to get the article right. for free. 
Um, I've used that. People, use, I, I have a research gate account. I'm contacted all the time by people who want the free article. So contacting the author, contacting friends, contacting the librarian. Um, and sometimes I even contact the editor of the journal, <laughs> who I know. I know the edit, most of the editors of many of the ed tech journals. But, you know, um, or an assistant editor, maybe not the head one who might have a problem sending it out for free. I will contact mm -hmm. the assistant editor oftentimes. But there are ways to get the articles if you absolutely have to have to have them for your research. You can eventually get them. Um, I also have an assistant and he's sneaky and he can find almost everything. You know, if, the, if it's a New York Times article and you, and you have a subscription, He'll create a, mm. a, a membership for one month and get a couple of free articles and many <laughs> times for a month. And he'll create another membership for next month. So he told me all there are all sorts of ways to get New York Times and Washington Post and other articles, even though they're subscription based, The Economist. So those are not professional journals necessarily, but sometimes they have important mm. articles like this week about chat GPT mm. and other kinds of things. So you, he told me that you create memberships that last for a month and you can get most of the things off of uh, most of the, these journals and magazines that have limited subscriptions you can you can find and get them that way so there are there are again multiple ways and sometimes you just have to keep searching often an article is blocked but somebody has posted it somewhere you know and then you can get it that way too so you know just keep looking and keep asking event if you have to pay with you if you have to pay for a couple of them, then so be it. Um, but your librarian should, you know, carrying your librarian down at the University of Houston. I've been in your library. It's a great library. Um, right. And I'm sure they have access there. And, um, you know, so you as up in Chicago, you know, she has access to libraries up there. But but really the IU library for her, her access will get her, you know, um, all the power. I'm sure Paula coming from coming from Canada over there, she can you know, can access things through the IU library that she couldn't get in Canada. So um, maybe we should have a librarian come one week if we, you know, and tell us what's yeah, there right. to help the, you know, doctoral students. Why don't you keep going? Because we're going to, we're getting, we okay. have to go through yeah. Zihong and then we'll have to take a break. So. Right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and create many version of your proposal so you know no perfect proposal the first time so already i feel that every revision you know makes better so for my case for proposal around 10 times i revise but every time you know i think that before i thought that, oh it's the best but every time i get the feedback from my advisor and they, oh that is better and then so every time it's who better who is doing and that to you I, who is doing that <laughs> i don't know who is my advisor but anyway so i highly recommend and then just don't delete the old version you have to keep every version you know it's really important just keep multiple version and then every time just a little bit you know just to change and they always you know contact your you know advisor the best way i think and, and then, also you might put at 2 p um january 17th at 5 p.m january 17th at 10 p.m if you've got your advisor giving you feedback then you can keep track of when you know that you know right. you who's who's you're managing the control process because i i edit them a lot and some advisors mm -hmm. might edit them a lot as the hung knows as soon knows i i edit quite a bit and then I scan them in and send them back um so you know you just keep shaping it you keep working on it eventually you get it to where you want it um so yeah yeah and then third recommendation is to write a simple genre so for my case actually I created just a blog and then I I made some to the list to, during this course, so taking R795, and then reference is the top, and then whatever, you know, every time I collect a new article, at that time I make a citation list, and then the le left part is week 13, and then I write really simple sentences in what I did, and then I check, and then, you know, I who I talk to, you know, what I got, you know, feedback from my advisor or my peer or something, and then I have to check. So it's a really good guideline. And then it's kind of, it gave me uh, the direction, 
you know, just to, in my mind, I think about, you know, sometimes I forgot, but every time I check the, you know, to-do list and then journal check, so I can make it. So I highly recommend. You don't need to write really long sentences, just a keyword. So maybe just a two day and then, oh, we have some presentation, something, and I got something, 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 you know, something like that. So just keep journal for taking this class. I highly recommend, but maybe you have a different way, but my case, it worked very well. And last one is, it's really, really important. Just work with your advisor closely. Sometimes just some, especially EDD student, I think that they think that it's really hard to contact their advisor. That's because we are online, just so we can see each other via, you know, Zoom or email, right? So usually they are hesitant, but you know, it's your right. I think that whatever you, you have a question or if you have some problem just to talk to your advisor especially i bother my advisors a lot every time so i have a question or i have something you know i don't know right <laughs> every time i email him and then i got really quick feedback so that's the reason i finished it quickly i think that that's because actually i didn't you know think that I can pass the defense during summer? That's because you know, yeah, my advisor knew that. That's because many professors said that oh, I can work you know during summer, right? And then finally, I gave up. Okay, maybe you know for, but actually, my advisor recommend oh, you can find another you know you know committee member, and then I found found out another really good you know committee member, and then I did. So just, you know, try to contact your advisor really closely. That's it. And the last important thing is just to candidate form and then schedule proposal defense ASAP. And then the third one is really important. That's because actually I think that as for other class, you might have some CT certificate, but that one is, I think that different name. So two types of CT certificate right now we have to take. The first one is, I don't know, I'm not sure, basic something. So this one is actually stage one. So for IIB, we need that one. After taking this certificate, you can submit the IIB form. So just click the link and then just to check you got the, this certificate or not, okay? That is my recommendation if you have any question just to ask me any not, just to... any questions okay. you can click out of the share um stop sharing here and yes. i think i put your slides in dropbox so you can have access to those any comments yeah. or questions uh hey Jean. No, I just clapped. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's a lot of important details in there, especially if you're at the EDD level and trying to figure out the, the, the coming semester and what you're going to be doing. Um, so all the logistics that you have to keep track of, right? Yeah. So let's give Sunne a round of applause here, and she'll be with us for all 15 weeks. So, you know, if you have a question of any uh, mm -hmm. item on here, she will be here to answer them. Um, I have sent back your task zero to all of you, the plagiarism task. Um, normally, I don't read on the screen and comment, but I found that to be very effective this time. I might do that for the next one. I think we have another assignment. Task one is going to be due coming up. Um, and that is, um, what day? So January, that's due today, which is really due how many days, how many day grace period do we have a three day grace period or something like that in this class? Um, three so days, three day, so Wednesday, Thursday. So it's really due Friday night at midnight. And I think I'll try and mark on them again. I'll download them again, try and do them in, in word as opposed to PowerPoint. And I'll try and mark them up rather than scan, downloading and scanning and sending back. But but we'll see. 
with with eight students, it's not too hard. Um, see hung. And, and by the way, task one examples are in Dropbox, lots of them. So if you don't know what to do for the data, what is it? What's the first thing? Is it data analysis or research questions or what is it? Research goals, statements or research goals. So there's examples. Zihang. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, let me share my. I don't have a. I don't have a you know <laughs> that many page slides. So um, this is. Can you see the slide? Yes, we can. Oh, good. Let me enlarge it. Um, so Sumi uh, shared um, a lot of information about the details, about the procedure. And then I think it's very helpful. Uh, so my part is going to focus more on the writing part, some, um, some uh, strategies I want to share with you or tips, uh, I would say. Um, let me uh, quickly go through those and then we can move on to Dr. Bonk's section. Um, so first, choose a topic you are truly interested in. Uh, I know right now, uh, probably you have a lot of ideas um, about your uh, dissertation topics, right? And there, <laughs> and maybe you have a l long list. And uh, so you might want to spend time and thinking about, okay, um, which topic you want to work on for your dissertation project. Um, I have um, heard a lot of stories about, you know, people give up actually in the middle or in the end, uh, can toward the end of the project because the, the, they didn't like the topic as they thought they would. So um, find a very, find a topic you love the best and then that would motivate you um, through the process. So my dissertation was about digital badges and then how to use it for faculty development purpose. And then that's kind of um, closely related to what I do and my and work. So whenever I want to, <laughs> I wanted to give up or I wanted to postpone it. I thought, okay, I really I, I like this topic. I want I want to work on that. I I'm very curious about what people have found out, and I want to know how we can use it better for faculty development. Uh, so choose a topic you are truly interested in, and then. Um, second, schedule backwards and think about um, how long you are going to work on those things. Like, for example, your dissertation proposal, set a deadline for yourself. I, I think probably your advisor won't set a deadline for you. Most of the time, they won't set a deadline for you. You have to be the owner of your project and then you have to set a deadline for yourself and then go backward and think about, okay, if this is the deadline, for example, in June, and then how long I need to work on, you know, this, this uh, proposal, and then how long you work, of, uh, so maybe three months, and then before you turn it in, and then you also need some time to revise it, right? So just go backward and then think about, okay, I need to find a topic and then work on this thing. And I need to leave some time for feedback and a revision. And then by deadline, you submit the, 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 the proposal um, and the market on your calendar. Um, next, being flexible and the reset deadlines along the way. Um, I'm not sure, I mean, I, I'm sure some people you know, you have a full-time job and and then you have families, right? And then there are a lot on the plate. So just, you know, don't push yourself too much. Being flexible and know, you know, things might happen in life all the time. And uh, if mm, 
and something you know sometime or someday you just um maybe a good a bad day or a bad week so you give yourself a break and then uh, um reset the deadlines um next i i think some me and dr bonk already mentioned that um find uh, work with your mentor or your advisor and then work with your support group or your peers that's very important if you rely on yourself if you work alone uh, a lot of times um you might feel um you know it's very hard to move forward um uh, and then we need um to 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 work with other people to keep motivated to keep engaged and then to keep going um schedule time for your writing every day um i mean in the in the beginning i of my project i thought okay i'm going to just uh, i told myself i'm going to write something maybe just uh, one paragraph graph you know like each day i actually didn't mark it on my calendar or i didn't save um a blog time every day for my writing so i kept postponing that and uh, so uh, until i read a book chapter uh which was shared by uh, like one english professor i was working with um it's on the next page it's called a desperation writing and how to write a lot so i will share uh with you the the pdf after this um so um that chapter kind of the desperation writing yeah i uh, it's like a click okay <laughs> i i after i read it i finally decided to schedule time um no every day for my writing and uh, just mark it on your calendar um uh, and then claim writing time by learning to say no um uh, since so a lot of people might come up to you and they say okay can you do this and can you do that and then uh, during this process you know when you work on your dissertation proposal and dissertation writing and then think about your priorities um and um it's okay to say no um and then your dissertation would be your top all right priorities i think for the this year next year probably and then um learn to say no that's kind of lesson i learned uh sit down to write um maybe you already heard about that but <laughs> uh, i um i didn't believe this a lot in the beginning but later i realized yes it's very hard uh, the most the most difficult part or piece is to stay down that's the most difficult part once you stay down and then you start to work on your proposal or on your dissertation writing yeah that's kind of easier the more you work on that uh start with free writing don't uh think too much don't worry too much about you know the words or whether it's very clear or whether it's you know um especially for international students uh you might be concerned about okay the grammar and then you know uh, i'm not a native speaker uh whether this is a good uh i mean uh i need to submit this to my advisor um whether this is good so you might have a lot of self doubt doubting um please don't and just do free writing uh whenever you think about whatever yeah when i was showering when i was doing laundry when i was walking i always thought about i had some ideas you know on my dissertation so i always just wrote them down just um on a piece of paper uh and then have a note on your computer uh save a copy so start with a free writing don't think about too much don't worry about the grammar thing and then the 
whether it's um, elegant, um, and then you can always come back and revise it. Actually, we have to revise it again and again for a few times um, before you submit your final dissertation. And uh, celebrate uh, ach uh, your achievements as you, as you go. A lot of times we just keep going, keep going, and then we want to uh, arrive in the de destination, but just give, your, uh, give yourself a break sometimes and then celebrate um, after you finish chapter, I mean, start with dissertation proposal. So you finish that and then celebrate and then do something you really want to do and then start with maybe one, uh, chapter one after you finish chapter one and yeah, do something uh, for yourself. Self-care is very important in this process uh, to keep you um, moving forward and then trust your mentor. I think Dr. Bongo already, already mentioned that. Um, so always work with your advisor and trust him or her uh, and uh, always get feedback from him or her. Um, uh, last piece, start a full-time job before you finish your dissertation. Um, I, I know maybe a few of you, a few of you already uh, have a full-time job, so that's not a question for you. And then if you're a full-time student, uh, and then think about whether you want to start a full-time job before you um, finish your dissertation. Since when I was in the program, um, I heard a lot of stories from my peers or fellow students. Uh, a lot of people actually, they, they, they never finish their dissertation once they start a full-time job and then start a family and then uh, move away from Bloomington, go to another city or go to another state or even another country. So it's kind of very hard to keep uh, motivated and keep, you know, um, engaged in this dissertation writing process. Uh, and then think about that. Uh, talk to your advisor, talk to your peers uh, before you make a decision. Um, so those are the strategies I, I think um, which helped me a lot in the process. And then I want to share with you uh, some resources, uh, I mentioned the desperation writing shared by an English professor uh, and then uh, free writing. Uh, I think I have the two PDFs and I will share with Dr. Bonk uh, and how to write a lot. That book, uh, I think I ordered uh, through Amazon. So it's in my um, uh, Kindle, uh, which I cannot uh, share with you. So, but it's it's not that expensive and it's a good book um, for writing. Uh, and uh, another technique, I think Dr. Bonk is going to mention that in the next session. Uh, and uh, I, I kind of just want to bring it up. It's called a, po uh, a Pomodoro. Yeah, I use that every day when I was, write, when I was writing my dissertation and uh, you could, uh, actually um, install this pom uh, Pomodoro Assistant uh, add-on on your, on your Google Chrome, I think, the web browser. Uh, so it, you, 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 you could install it on your uh, Google Chrome. And then whenever you start uh, writing, you just check it and then it will track how long you, you worked on, on writing. And then basically, yeah, it, it's just like a, you know, it's a pattern. You you <laughs> you work on um, the writing for maybe half an hour, and then you take a short break, and then after maybe three times, uh, maybe two hours, and then you take a longer uh, break, like a half an hour break. So that that was very effective to me. Um, I think Dr. Bonk will mention that too in the next section. Um, and then I want to say you are making wonderful progress already, keeping it, and that uh, you have others. And uh, best wishes to you all.
Any questions for Zihan? We have a jam board if you want to put those questions in there. Um, so feel free. I'll be making, let me make a few comments. One, if you're a PhD student and not working full time and get a job before you finish your dissertation, um, I think more than half of the time that's problematic. It's not always, you can still finish, but I have seen people once they go on to a full-time job, they don't finish. They don't make any progress or it's very incrementally slow. Uh, and some people take all seven years that they have allotted to them, <laughs> which Sihang has experienced, <laughs> right Sihang? Um, and other people, you know, set, a, set some, some pretty stringent deadlines on themselves, but it's hard keeping deadlines once you expand your family. I know my son came from Korea three days before I defended my dissertation. That was rather difficult. Um, and so, you know, once you take a full-time job, it's really difficult to get refocused on a dissertation. So that's an important point. EAD students, almost nine out of 10 of you are working full-time already. So it's nothing new. What you have to do is maybe see if you can find some days off or work for some students are able to work four day work weeks. They get negotiated with their boss or their employer and say, hey, I'm working on my dissertation. Is there any way maybe for the next month to get two weeks and be able to work and get paid for work on company time and just be working on my dissertation during maybe we're transitioning between projects. And while we're transitioning between projects, you might, you know, can I utilize the, the couple of weeks we're ramping up to the new project to work on my dissertation. Everyone's situation is different. Not, every, not everyone's going to get paid time off or paid time to work, but I'm hearing it more and more. Increasingly, employees are getting time to work on dissertations. Um, I know that was true of one of our students working at the Defense Language Institute in Monterey, California, as they, were, as they were basically deleting the program he was on, he was being moved to a new program. They were, they, actually employers, I got one student who's now working at Brandeis University and her employers really want her to get done. They're actually the employers are oftentimes your, your, your cheerleaders. They want you to help you and, get, and make sure you have that credential. I think Zihong, went to a conference in the summer or in the spring where they had her name on the conference listing say that she's working on her dissertation or had finished her congratulations I forget what the story was Zihong but you know your you, people is a huge in the state of Indiana conference or IU based conference that got her name up in lights because she was working on her dissertation so people are very supportive what was the story behind that Zihong uh, it's statewide IT conference, I think, every April in Bloomington. Uh, yeah, so um, my bosses and uh, the managers and then uh, my peers, my colleagues, they were there and then they sent a lot of messages on Slack um, and then the internal channel uh, to me and then they were very supportive. And so that is the more the norm than the anomaly. Um, so do y'all mention, I'm sure all of you have mentioned you're working on your dissertation to your current employer. If you're a PhD student, you're working half-time maybe or part-time and they everyone knows um, and maybe update them from time to time, tell them the status that you're at. Um, and it's important to know. So that's important. Um, number two, Zihang says, your advisor will not set a deadline. Well, that's almost always true, but not always true. Sometimes your advisor will set a deadline when they know they're gonna be going on, uh, on a longer trip, maybe a Fulbright scholarship, maybe they have, you know, uh, are working at a, you know, temporarily at another institution, maybe they're being secundered to Washington DC to work for the, you know, AERA, like one of my colleagues is right now, or maybe they're gonna plan to retire, or maybe they're going, they plan to get sick. I mean, well, in my case, I was on my students, um, not on, I was inquiring with all my students um, if any of them could get done by December last year. 
So I sent all my advisees a note uh, a couple times. I said, aren't you, are you sure you can't get done by December? Because they were, you know, they were stringing it out. A couple of my students should have gotten done by December. And the reason, <laughs> I had a selfish reason for it. I had 13 students finish in 2022. I had seven finish in 2021. I, I had, um, I was on number 12. I was trying to get 13 so that I could say I had 20 students finish over two years. It was, I know it was a selfish reason, but <laughs> I did I did set deadlines for, for a couple of them just to push them a little bit, nudge them a little bit. Um, it was a selfish way, but uh, but it, it helped just checking in with them. I wasn't really pushy pushy. I was just checking in. Uh, her point about celebrations. Celebrations can take many formats. It could be taking a trip to a museum or a zoo. It could be, you know, uh, so, you know, uh, giving yourself a bottle of champagne, or it could be an ice cream cone at Chocolate Moose here in Bloomington, or going to Mother Bear's Pizza. Celebrations take many formats. Uh, it could just, you know, yeah, it could be a family, it could be a friends, um, but do celebrate. So I'm working on a special issue for online learning journal. We're going to be, it's going to come out in March. Everyone's going to be at the ERA conference in April. So I told the editor of the journal, maybe we should have a celebration in April. And he said, that's a great idea. So often when you finish a project, you should plan a celebration around it to, to make it a distinctive mark. Uh, number four, she said free writing. Free writing uh, and not being so concerned about grammar or spelling or even the, even the content that's in there. You know, if we get enamored with our own content or are too critical, we don't get anything on paper. The first thing you need to do is get thought on paper. Once you get thought on paper, it can become coherent prose later, cogent prose later, logical prose later. First, you have to be creative. You have to be generative. You have to be divergent. You can't um, finish any documents unless you engage in the divergent convergent process, which writing is. All life is a divergent convergent process. We first have to generate ideas, then we can evaluate them. But if you're just sitting at the point of utterance, at the point of the pen, at the you know things at the tip of your tongue, knowledge. Uh, if you're tinkering at the point of utterance, uh, if you will, if if you're just constantly looking at the last word that you said and fixating on it, the last sentence, you'll never get anywhere. You have to have some time where you turn the machine off, turn the screen off, and you don't look at what you're writing, and just you know. Uh, free writing or wet inking or whatever you want to call it. There has to be moments like that. Now, we wrote an introduction to the special issue, and I wrote a couple paragraphs that was gib gibberish. Sometimes you have to write gibberish first, and then you take the gibberish and you delete the stuff that's really junky, and you keep the stuff that was good, and you massage it a little bit, and eventually it you have something really unique and original nobody would ever thought about, but you had to start with the generative side. Um, before you go to the evaluate. So it's a back and forth process. It's a back and forth. The sixth thing she said, or fifth thing she said, elbow, elbow grease. No, Peter Elbow. He's a very famous guy. And so the book she recommended by Peter Elbow, I, I was recommended that book as well and reading from Peter Elbow when I was a graduate student. And I learned a lot from him because I was a writing researcher. I was doing my dissertations on computers and writing. He's a famous writing guy in the UK. I, I recommend his book. He's, he's a wonderful writer, you would guess. He, now, finally, the Pomodoro method. I won't get to that until week. 14 in here or 13 in here. Um, so I'm glad Zihang introduced it now because I won't get to it till later. I'm not going to talk about it after break, uh, but some people find it very valuable to structure their time and to get them energized. It also gives you license to say no to other people. A lot of effective techniques in life have a, have a label to them. I'm doing this now. I'm engaging in the jigsaw method. I'm doing... Uh, you know, um, reverse brainstorming or whatever it is, um, I'm taking, I'm doing role taking, I'm uh, playing uh, or whatever. Those, those, the, the labels and tags that we get, the roles that we play in Canvas discussion groups or um, the, um, you know, I'm, I'm doing a free writing right now. I can't respond to email. I can't, you know, you just put, you might have a little, you know, thing in your email notice to when people emailed me that you're not available or whatever. Those gives you a license to say no. Often we need license to say no to people because we're all we're all too nice. People ask us and nudge us and ask us to be on the gist committee for IST conference or do the. You can't do everything. 
you got to say no to some things. So I've created two lists of no. I've created 10 honest ways to say no and 10 dishonest ways to say no. 10 that are blatant lies. Like I'm going to be spending the summer with my grandmother. My grandmas are dead. You know, that's a total lie. I try not to use the lies. I try to limit to the 10 that are honest ways to say no. Um, once in a great while, I look at the, that's a pretty good one. I can get this guy off my case from Saudi Arabia, who's constantly hounding me to do something that I don't want to do, you know? And so, but you try not to lie to anybody. You try and be honest and, but you have to have, so some of, some of you, when you get a, if you get a faculty position, will have your mentor or your supervisor, even when you're working in corporate, give you the, the, the constraints. You, you know, when I started at IU, I got on all these teacher ed reform committees. And when I was at West Virginia, I was on all these teacher ed reform committees, about 20 of them over two, three years. It was ridiculous. There were so many committees. Finally, my supervisor said, you have to say no. You can't be on all these things. And so it wasn't me saying no. It was my supervisor said no. So if you're in one of those situations now when writing a dissertation proposal and you need time, talk to your supervisor and say, I know so-and-so is going to want me on this project. Uh, so-and-so keeps asking me to help on this project. Could could I get, could I, could you say that I can't be on it so that I can tell him or her that I can't be on it? So then it's not you saying no, it's your advisor saying no. And you feel better about it. You feel, oh, thank goodness, you know, one of those things. So I just wanted to add that, that you have to have a list somewhere nearby of ways to say no and look at the list and you know just for some some people they have one thing on their list they for so often we're asked to write recommendation letters um tenure and promotion letters as a faculty we're writing reviews of other faculty at uh, university of hong kong who don't even know the person um university of lancaster in the uk we get i get in march april may and june i get all these emails can you do a promotion and tenure letter? So one way to say no to such things is to say, I've done my limit for this. I would love to do it, but I've done my limit for this year. I've already done X, Y, Z number of them. And I don't, I, every year I don't do more than that. So I can save, or in other ways, I'm, I'm saving the summer months to finish X, Y, Z, to write my proposal, to write chapter two. And so you block out. I have, I have a planner, an actual physical planner that I can take a picture of, and I will write on here in the month of June, I will say, or the month of July, or, or the month of August, I'll block the whole month off. And then I will take a picture, I'll block it, I'll say, I'm going to write a paper that month, I'm going to write a book that month. And then I'll take a picture of that when someone sends me an email asking me to do X, Y, Z. So in my planner, I've planned to do this for the month of July. I can't do anything else during the month of July. I have to work on chapter two of my dissertation or chapter one, you know, whatever it is. So have a physical space and just write down, this is, I'm, or I'm on vacation these two weeks with family. And then you can send them a picture of that and say, to, to be honest to myself, to be true to myself, to be healthy, I have to abide by my what my planner has. And I can't do that during the month of July or August. Here are, so the other thing I've come up with, here are five other people I work with that might be really happy to do your project. <laughs> so I've got actually a list of a hundred people in the field of ed tech that are leaders in the field. Now I'll send them all these other names and emails and bios and say, so one of these other people might be good for that. And that's a real, you know, it's helped me not say no. And it's helped me get them done and not be on... So it's called OPPs, other people's projects. You don't want to do too many OPPs. If you do all these other people's projects, you'll never do anything for yourself. But you don't want to be mean. You want to be collegial. You want to be, you know, all these good things. Um, did Si Hung, where's Si Hung? We lost her. She wanted to say something and, and, and we lost her. She was, uh, I think maybe she'll come back. Um, Anyways, <laughs> I'm sorry to see Hung. Uh, she was raising her hand a couple of times, and I, uh, I and and yeah, I'll write to her during break. Um, comments or questions? Hey, Zhang, you're you're smiling. <laughs> was it a? You resonate with any of those things? 
I just totally agree with what you said. Yeah, I often smile a lot. <laughs> Jake, you're smiling. You resonate with any of the points being made there? Just soaking it all in, you know, but yes, all good information for sure. Okay. Oh, Zi Hung's computer's rebooting. She's going to, yeah. Um, okay. So, yeah. So she's, she says she's going to get kicked off. I'll talk to her during break briefly. Any comments or questions for me or Sune or items of discussion? Recommendations for who we might get as a speaker in here or other topics you're interested in. Well, my have, coffee, go ahead. Sorry, I have kind of a, a side note question. Yep. So as uh, Sumi was talking about making sure you look at what you need to be getting done and, and filling out all the forms and stuff, I went on the uh, School of Ed website and found that checklist that they have. And there was something in there that I am not sure what this is and if this is something we need to fill out for. It says early inquiry experience. Do we have to fill out a form for that? Or does that is that something that's kind of an automatic thing as one of the classes we took? So I think the, they, you, you don't need to submit any form for that. Okay. I think that there are required inquiry courses. So you finish, it's OK, I think. Yeah. OK. So we don't have to do anything about that. OK, thank yeah. you. Yeah. It used to be more formalistic. I don't think that. And for the PhD students, your 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 first author study um, covers that. So yeah, I don't think there's anything you have to be filling out, but you might double check with Vicky if you want to. Um, but I think Sume having Sume here who hadn't, I, I'd trust Sume because she just went through all that. So I Tina? asked Dr. L. I asked Dr. L that uh, exact question, and she said it was R six ninety that yeah. counted for early inquiry. There you go. You got to take R690. Yeah, that's right. That is that is the answer. <laughs> I can't remember all these answers, unfortunately. <laughs> other, any other question like that? That's, that was a good question. Well, if not, let's take a five minute break. My tea is empty in my Starbucks Korea cup, as you see. Um, it's totally empty, so I need, it's pretty dirty too. <laughs> so I'm going to refresh my tea and come back in five minutes. I, I looked through my notes a, a little bit ago, and it, I think this, this last part will be hopefully some, a lot of things that you can use and take from it, especially the ending. So I will see you in a, in a, in a few minutes. I'm going to pause the recording if I can figure out how to do it. I just saw it up here. I'm resuming recording. I know some of you may still be in your by your refrigerator or stove, out on your patio, reflecting on how to say no. <laughs> there are many ways to say no. I should probably soon be remind me, and we have to do two things after class: come up with a list of how to say no. <laughs> I'll send them send them my list if I can find my list of how to say no, and also to put the practice quals in Canvas for the EDD students. Uh, we can do that. And maybe also get C Hung slides and put C Hung slides and your templates into, into Dropbox. So there's a few things that we could do <clears throat> to help students out. Next week in here, we have a trio that all arrived at Indiana Bloomington in 2010 as master's students. As I've mentioned before, Yua, who is in uh, sitting in this class, Yua Ma, along with um, Shuya Chu, and also Mangwan Zhao. Mangwan is almost done with analyzing her dissertation data. Uh, Yua is writing her proposal, and Shu Shuya finished her. So Shuya, Shuya is at the PhD level, and Yua and Mangwan at the EDD level. We'll hear from all three of them about their experiences that they've had and their advices. It'll be kind of like a panel, a panel of friends. I've never done that before. We've never had three people enter to, to at the same time and all 
decide to go to get their doctorates after finishing their masters. I don't think that's happened before where we've had three students, especially three students from another country, in this case, all from China, all started at the same time, all started as master's students, and they're all deciding to get their doctorates. And one out of three is done so far. Uh, the week after, we'll have Alyssa Wise from NYU, who is a grad of both the IST program and learning science program. And she's got many uh, research articles on learning analytics, which is a hot topic today. And she's got a book about qualitative tools for research, along with Jessica Lester from our um, Counseling and Ed Psych Department, our inquiry program. And um, she'll also maybe talk a little bit about design-based research, but we'll have an Ask Me Anything session with Alyssa Wise. And Alyssa's a really, really sharp person, really smart, with lots of grant money right now. She was at Simon Fraser when her career started, Simon Fraser University in the West side of the North America. Now she's at the east side of North America working at NYU. And she was in the middle, smack dab, working at Indiana. And I, you know, I had helped her when she was a grad student. She did a study in, I think, the Dominican, Rep uh, Dominican Republic and about K-12 computer access, I think. We'll have to ask her about that. The, the week after that, we have Aaron Crisp, and Angie Lachman. Aaron is from Indiana, Angie's from Michigan, and they both have come a couple of times before individually, They've never come together. They're both EDD graduates, so I may try and get a couple PhD graduates. We'll have a panel. I'm a little hesitant though about adding to it because usually Aaron and Angie have a ton of useful tips about the dissertation process but I, I think I'm not gonna have them walk through those tips from start to end. I think I have might have them pull out five minutes of their best tips and guides from each of them and then open it up for a question. Maybe more of a, a show and tell and then a panel uh, or a yeah, panel discussion kind of thing, the way the panels are at conferences. And that's why I might add a PhD student to that or one or two actually just to have a balance there, but we'll see. Uh, it's something. And then after that, we have Adam Mills from the IRB board from Human Subjects. And then we have one-to-one -one meetings with me. So we'll be scheduling soon. Me and I will be scheduling on, hopefully on Tuesdays, maybe two sets of four, maybe two, one group of four, maybe in the morning or after late morning or early afternoon, another group of four at night. I'm not sure. Um, we can do them on multiple days, but I'll try first of all to get them all on um, that's it's not until Tuesday the 21st. Now, some faculty who teach R795 do it only as one-to-one -one meetings. So you might have gotten advice from your advisor to take this class, and yet you probably heard that it was a lot of one-to-one -one meetings with the instructor teaching the course. That's not how I do this course. I do a combination of things, as I mentioned. I want people to get three things out of this class. Can't remember what those three things are, but I want to get ahead three things. I want you to be better writers as a result of this class. I want you to be better researchers as a result of this class. And I want you to have a quality dissertation proposal as a result of this class. And so it's a three-pronged approach. And I also hope that the students in this, this class can be supportive of each other when they exit this class and so they become friends and colleagues, and so you can help each other uh, along your dissertation process and along the way. As soon as we said, she had a study group. The students last semester formed a study group, and we had Ben and Kim and Megan and Shannon. They all got me a coffee cup that said, fall 2022, R795, Students are legends. <laughs> Notice that I broke the cup already. <laughs> I haven't told them that I broke the cup. I'm still using it. I'm going to have to get a plastic cover on the top, on the lid. So if anyone can find an Amazon, a, how to get a plastic rims, especially colorful ones, maybe one in red, that's IU color. I can get that and they won't even know. <laughs> I can, um, so if you find one, send me an email with that. I want to buy one that it's maybe about two and a half inches wide or three inches wide. I don't have a measure right here, but there, there, there are such things. I know you can get them in Amazon. I haven't been able to locate the one, the one I need. 
So anyways, my students like the class so much, they got me a cup. I'm not putting any pressure on the students this semester to, to get me a shirt or a cup or a new computer or a new car. But, you know, if somewhere along the way you like to, yeah, Tina's got her three. Okay, so you could create one at your mill, huh? <laughs> yeah, your mill. You have uh, mill. Yeah, how about your mill? Yeah. So what do you need? Dimensions? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, I'll be, so someone, someone finds it in Amazon, it's great, send me an email. If not, I will send you the dimensions. Um, that sounds good. Any, any thoughts percolate in your brain during break that you want to raise before I go to the, the end of the um, presentation about writing and defending? <clears throat> I have a thought, like when you guys were talking about, um, not um editing for or grammar and flow and whatever <clears throat> i i write a lot of fiction so that it's very similar advice that they give but <clears throat> just know um you're in good um company cuz george r r martin does the same thing and he actually when he writes he does it on like an old 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 word processor like a brother word processor something that doesn't even do uh autocorrect or show your errors or anything like that like he just wants to have that flow um so it doesn't mess up his creativeness some people like typewriters those old typewriters because you can't go back and fix all the changes that's exactly right i've read that a couple a couple they buy old typewriters because they can't go back and fix the errors they can just just have to keep typing away you know I've used typewriters. I cannot say there, I'll definitely say that I prefer typing on a keyboard. Um, I'm a tinkerer, but I do get into moments of flow. And, and we, that's what we want. We want moments of moments of flow. You can't expect flow all the time, but you have to have those, set, you set the stage for flow to happen. The alert, the environment that you're working in. And Mena Ju and I and others will talk about Dave Lee and Yoha, her husband will come in the week 12, I think it is, to talk about that setting your writing space up, which has been a real interest of mine during the past few years. I've had many speakers in this class talk about their writing space. I've given conference presentations on the writing space and setting up your writing space. So um so if you can create some place that you're comfortable in working from, you will be more productive. Um, <clears throat> and it may change during your life what the space looks like, wh what, what the requirements of the space are. Sometimes you might have young children at home. That's, you know, your, your space and your time to write will change. Sunmei's kids are in their teens now. Her writing space is probably much different than what, 10 years ago when they were young children. Now as her teenager, she can tell them to go away, go away. No. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> they still need to be picked up from schools most of the time. Any other comments? Uh, let's spin around here real quick and just remind me who your advisor is. Barbara, who's your advisor? Sorry, I'm having the worst time tonight with my mouse. Um, Dr. Glazuski. Okay, Dr. G. Tina? Uh, Dr. Lefwich. Dr. L, Dr. G. Jake? Dr. L also. Two L's and one G. Paula? Dr. Bunk. Two L's, <laughs> two L's a G and a B. Uh, hey, Jean? Dr. Brosh. And a B, a couple B's. Okay. And Tofik. Tofik. All right, it's Dr. Brush. Okay, a couple brushes, a bunk. Couple left, which is in a, a Glazuski, and Sunme is is mine. So we got two of mine. If Si Hung comes back, I'd, I'd have three, but she's already done. Okay. So um, just curious who, who your advisor is, because um, in effect, where you're at today, most of you, most of you will be putting proposals in about the same time. So Dr. Brush and Dr. L will be hit up with a couple of proposals, Dr. G1 and so forth. I'm just curious. Okay, let me share my screen if I can find my slides here and I have to open all my windows up. And there we go. So we ended, if you remember from last time, um, 
Let's see here. So last time we had um, Alexander Gold's article up from Inside Higher Education on how to tackle revisions, you know, and, and she had some points that she was making about don't delete stuff, just save it again. Um, there's no such thing as wasted writing, no such thing as wasted thought. You just use what you can. Um, you know, you can start with a flexible timeline or flow chart or a revision plan. Start with the small scale things and move on to the bigger items. You know, if you tackle the small hanging, the low hanging fruit, the small changes, then your brain can focus on the bigger things later. You know, uh, if you have 40 things that the, the journal editors want you to change and 30 of them are easy, do the three things that are easy and save the five things that are medium and the five things that are hard for later. Uh, we, my team just got, or one of my teams just got a paper rejected. It actually didn't say reject, just said they couldn't accept it for publication. They had about maybe 15 or 20 things they want changed or moved around. It's not, I don't think it's that hard. My team thought it was hard, but I don't really think it was that hard. Um, you just have to plan it out on the revisionary table. What are the things they want and what, how are you going to change it? And, and what did you do to change it? So these are the, all, and then uh, Burs, uh, Burton Lewis also said, you know, take some breaks, recognize that, you know, writing is writing. Don't worry about grammar and punctuation. Think about writing small bits like your biography or your limitations or your acknowledge, acknowledgements. So yesterday or two days ago, I wrote the acknowledgements for an article. We need, we didn't, we didn't plan to write it, but the editors the, the reviewers said, you really needed acknowledgments because you presented the research at five different conferences before you ever wrote this paper. You have to acknowledge that. So we had to create an acknowledgement. So I so I had different things. So let me move on from those. So, okay, so the next article, before I get to my 10, 10 tips for defending and 10, 10 tips for writing a dissertation, I'm going to go through a few of the other articles that were in Inside Higher Ed or the Chronicle of Higher Ed. This was two years ago, Daniel Sequoia from Inside Higher Ed, how to avoid failing a dissertation. These are his four points. Um, if you reflect on the critical flow of your dissertation, and not just write, but reflect on what is your writing, who you're writing for, uh, what is the purpose, what is the audience? You know, just, you, sure, we all wanna get done. We all want thought on paper, but at some point you gotta reflect on the logical structures. The most common mistake is a lack of reflection on the points that one's making. You just say, oh, I got this finding. I'll put it down. It's called knowledge telling. We, we, we need to move from knowledge telling to knowledge transformation. Lack of coherence and logical flow. It's a similar point to number one, poor presentation, not editing it enough, not, not uh, putting subheadings in that make sense for people, not formatting it properly, just a bad uh, presentation structure and failure to make the changes that your committee wants. Now, you would think number four would never happen. <laughs> I, I had 13 dissertation defenses last year, and I had one person that didn't want to make the required changes of her committee. That was a mistake. <laughs> Even if you disagree with your committee members, at least try to agree with something that they've said. You, know, you can say, oh, that was a really good point. This is how I changed it. You don't have to agree with everything they say. Talk to your advisor if you disagree with the committee members. So, you know, doctoral students should adapt a reflexive approach, Daniel says. You know, why have I chosen this method or these methods? What are the flaws? You know, what are the limitations that I have? What can I admit to that are problems? You know, if you can't, if you don't struggle with the with the issues or the problems, and you just see the positive side of your dissertation, you you won't make it through your dissertation because everybody has a flaw somewhere. You have to locate those and be honest about them and put them in your limitations and try to um, smooth them out where you can um, in in terms of your logical flow. So create a macro structure for your dissertation. Put a concept map, a mind map, some kind of logical flow. Um, it will save you a lot of time on the back end at the end of the dissertation if on the front end you kind of have the macro structure laid out of where you're heading with this and then the microstructure within every chapter. And then point Daniel says the third big issue is 
grammatical things. <laughs> uh, reference and now he may not be from the field of ed tech where everybody is stellar at their writing. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, you know, I, I I think he might be an English professor for what all I know. And soon they could look this up. Type in Daniel S O K O I in Inside Higher Ed. Um, and and find out what what his discipline is for us soon may. Um, so you know there's there's lots of grammatical mistakes in every dissertation. and I will find them because I'm trained as an accountant, and we're very detail oriented and I can be when I want to be. I normally don't like to be the, but I I start with people's reference section. And I edit the reference section. I really enjoy editing reference sections for whatever reason. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> it's something wrong with me. But most professors don't want to edit your grammar and your re reference section. They want to read it and uh, for the gist, for the logical flow. So often we recommend getting a proofreader and paying for that. So many students will pay uh, and there are people who are available. And I had a list somewhere with three people that will proofread your dissertation. I could probably find that for you if you needed it. So, you know, it, you might have long paragraphs, long sentences that, you know, some, type, some students have sentences that are 80 words long. <laughs> and they, they, they think academic prose needs to be long, longer than 20 words. Actually, you know, I think shorter is better. Shorter paragraphs, shorter sentences make it easier to read. So in a in a we finished a paper yesterday, the introduction for a special issue, and I took three of the paragraphs and broke them up into two uh, that my colleagues thought were great. They're really long, and even you know just break them up into two part. Um, so you know if the if your advisors, if your committee is always writing comments like you know, it's poorly written or the structure's not good or whatever it is, you know, they're going to, they don't want to fixate on the errors. But if you're always misspelling the same word wrong um, over and over and over again and, and other words wrong, you know, it's going to, it's going to slow us down in reading and it's going to frustrate at times. And then the number four, the failure to make the changes that the, that the advisors wanted, you know, um, and then, and then pointing out if you did change it, what you did. So how how you attempted to improve the the um, the discussion section, how you tried to align the discussion section with your research questions, how you added future directions and impact, and what those really are. So make the changes. Oftentimes, or dissertations students writing dissertations run out of steam at the end. They, they don't write good implications or future directions or limitations or conclusions. Usually at the end, it's kind of drizzly. You know, they kind of, they're, they're, they've, their mental capacities kind of run out. So, you know, um, if you're reviewing your paper, you say, does this thesis look good? Does it read well? Have you made the changes? Um, you know, how's the coherent, is the the structure coherent uh, for my for my re my committee members, and then might give that to your advisor and say, "What do you think of my change in the structure? What do you think about my new conclusion section? What do you think of the implications that I now have?" Another. So, Sunmay, did you find out where where Daniel is from? What's that? What What is it your Question exactly. I don't know. Oh, what it. university is he in and what discipline is he in? I'm just curious. Is he at a big place or a little place? Is he an English department or history professor? Still looking. What's that? Business. Yeah, professor at, at USC, yeah. Southern California. Ah, uh, USC, a big place. USC, yeah, in the business school. Okay, he's going to yeah. be a pretty picky kind of guy, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> more than likely. Okay, I'm just curious mm -hmm. if he, you know what, given this, he really focused on making errors, and so okay, business professors might do that. Okay, 
The next article from Danielle. So we had Daniel, and now we got Danielle Marius from writing in Inside Higher Ed of six years ago, actually. It was a little over six years ago. And she says, writing for 15 minutes a day, write down any thought, no grammar, is going to be helpful to your writing. Only writing produces text. It doesn't magically happen. So if you're going to overcome the writer's block that we might have, you just got to start writing and maybe meditate. A little bit of meditation doesn't hurt. The Pomodoro method to have a break, a five-minute break, and then come back to it. Write your write your checklist and put it in your pocket. Write your intentions journal. Um, I've been listening to a book lately about an ultra marathon runner, and he talks about having a, an, a an intentions journal, what he plans to do, and has everything planned out when he runs these ultra marathons and triathlons and all these things, and has a to do list, has a strategic plan in mind. Uh, if he doesn't have a strategic plan in mind, he often fails to to finish because he ends up starting off too fast and he doesn't allocate time properly. Now, I'm the opposite. I don't run fast at the beginning. I run fast at the end. And the same is true sometimes of my writing. I can write in, in spurts, but towards the end, oftentimes, once I have things written down, I, I tend to work faster and faster as I go through it. Some of you might be that way as well. Identify your most productive parts of the day. For me, it's at 2 o'clock in the morning or midnight, from midnight to 3 a.m. For other people, like Sue May, it's 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock in the morning she, or 8.30. Her kids go on the bus at 8.30, so she has to get up and gets up at 6 o'clock, has some tea, has breakfast a little bit, organize herself. And then she sits down at the computer from about 7 to 8 in the morning and then comes back at night from about uh, 9 to 11 at night. Is that right, Sue? I totally guessed. This is just what... A little bit different <laughs> nowadays, what? yeah. So usually what? my my daughter went to school at 6 a.m. So after really? then, I yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, her cheer practice schedule was changed. Yeah. So she went to school really early. And after then, my son, you know, ate something, you know, 8 a.m. And after then, I, I will, you know, I can start my work. And then after 5 or 6 p.m., and then I, you know, make dinner. And then usually after 8 p.m., you know, I can start my, you know, study. So oh. usually after 11 or 12 a.m. is perfect time for me. Really? What yes. about your full-time job? That's good. But during the day, so I have, you know, some meeting, you know. Yeah, nowadays I work on two different projects. So I have more meeting. <laughs> so why don't you all in the chat window put down what your most productive time of the day is, first of all. And then second thing I want you to put in the chat was what's one recent writing goal that you had? Maybe it was today, maybe it was yesterday, maybe it was last week. What's a writing goal that you met or are trying to meet? But first of all, first question is, when do you, when's your most productive point of the day? I'm just curious what you all would say on that. Let me stop this for a second. Nobody has written anything. Okay, all right. <laughs> Most productive time of the day for me is 11 p.m. to 3 a.m. After 11 a.m., 11 p.m. soon may. Okay, uh -huh. I agree. First, you got to cook. <laughs> My dinner's waiting down there. Um in the evenings, in the evenings, Barbara says, small scale, uh, Tofik, 6 to 10, 12 a.m. I'm not getting up with you, but okay, maybe 10 to 12. <laughs> now, why don't you write down one writing goal that you've had that maybe you've met? How was that? Not just a writing goal, but something you've written that, that was a goal of yours that you met. So um, I can put down in here. I wrote yeah we gotta write at least one sentence a day okay uh, promotion dossier in the fall wow that's big news okay that's not that's not easy to do. Congrats to you, Barbara. Um, 
we all feel your pain. <laughs> we'll see. I'll find out in, all, or in uh, April. <laughs> Everything exactly. Is good. Yeah. Academic. Hey, who just finished an article with Heijun? Tina, you finished one with Heijun? A short essay. What's the essay on? But the uh, article? Yeah. Uh, uh, so we just finished that this week, right, Heijun? Yeah, last week. Oh, well, was, yeah, it was last week. What's the title? Yeah, Computer Science Education for High School Students. Oh. What their positive and negative experiences and what factors affect their enrollment in the future. And where'd you send it to? Any place? Uh, Tech Trends. You did. Okay. Well, can okay. well, yeah, give you everyone a round of applause. That's huge. Okay. Congrats. Um, I personally have been remiss in not sending enough stuff to Tech Trends. I've had a few, but um, in, more recently, actually, it's good. It's it increasingly gets to be a a, a better and better journal over time, uh, and so really important. Okay. Let me go back to sharing my my screen here and see if I can get this to work again. Okay, so, you know, dividing up your time and your days, um, creating an attentions journal, a checklist, that kind of thing. Uh, write first in social media later, write first in ice cream later, write first in smartphone later. Um, you know, all these advices to avoid getting on your cacao talk if you're in Korea or line if you're in. <laughs> I've got cacao talk. I got line for Thailand and Taiwan. I've got WeChat for China. I've got Facebook for USA. I mean, you know, all my friends are in Kakao Talk line or WeChat. And so I avoid going in and, until I get something written. Uh, if your best time to write is in the morning, write in the morning. Park on a darn hill slope, which means when you're done writing for the day, if you're going to bed, save a little bit that's easy to start with the next day so you're not procrastinating the next day. Save something that, or maybe start a sentence that you know you can finish, but I'll oh, just finish it tomorrow. That way you can get back engaged in the in the process again. Uh, you, I have to say, yeah. the thing is like for coursework, we have deadline and weekly assignment or final final paper. So we have to keep the, keep the time. But on the other hand, for the dissertation, we don't have specific deadlines. So maybe it's very easy to procrastinate. Yeah. That's well, the thing. Yeah. How so, can we manage our time productively yeah. without deadline? Yeah. So you should be taking my classes, which are less deadline focused, instead of taking all the other. No, just kidding. <laughs> Talk to your professors and tell them, you know, that that you're <laughs> you're you're in a crunch time for writing a dissertation and that you need a little flexibility in terms of maybe the final assignment or midterm assignment, you can negotiate some things like that oftentimes, you know, with them. Um, number two, you know, one thing to do is you could, if I was doing this, I would take the courses that require a lot of deadlines all in the same semester and take the courses that are more free and easy and elective kinds of things all in the same semester. So you have the more of a cushion that you, you say, oh, I've got all these down. It's only this semester I can get through them. Those are These are the really tough classes where you have to get everything's due on a certain date. Just do all of them in one semester and lump them all together and find, and, and get, so ask the instructor for their syllabi and look for those, or, or another way to do it is to, to match, match them up. So you have three classes in a semester and you might take two that are really deadline focused and one that's not so deadline focused so that, so it's not so hard. So you have to figure out what's logistical in nature. I that's what I did. Yeah, I looked for those that had a lot of assignments due. You either you either lump them all together and do them all and get them all done, or you spread them out. But you know, you find you find the things that that work for you. So for me, I free up my time in the summer from May, June, July, and August for writing, and I teach you know intensively in the fall and spring, and then I have Christmas break. This kind of long you know, for getting writing stuff out. I, I know when I can get a lot of writing done. So you have to look at the macro level of your courses and of who you are and your family, whatever. And you can figure out when those writing spaces are. You can plan them out. You can put them on your planner. I actually have them right 
actually physically on a planner. I have six calendars in my office downstairs, month of January, February, March, April, May, and actually maybe December. I look and look at six months. We can go look back a month and forward, and I can look at that and I can say, oh, I can, so every, so when it ends in a month, I move all those calendars up a month and then I can plan, well, AACT is happening then, or uh, just IST conference is happening then, oh, so I can plan it all out. So you have to visualize it, you have to schedule it, um, and you have to, you know, maybe have a conversation with your advisor, with other people about, you know, here's, here's my goals for writing. I know I can get this done if I can be a little more flexible in my work schedule or my classes. I, I, I know that's not totally going to happen because of some people have very stringent criteria. I can say that when we had Professor Young Ju Cho worked in our department, who you probably know, she's left now, but she was very strict about her deadlines. I mean, very, very, very strict. And so, so other people are not so strict. Uh, and so I would, I would, you know, take two classes of people who are strict and then take one class of me <laughs> or someone like me. Or maybe Dr. Brush is a little more flexible. You know, I'm, you know I, don't want, I don't want to assume, but I'm just saying, you know, people whose last names start with a B uh, tend to be f real flexible. Um, okay, gain confidence, gain momentum. So um, fit, uh, advice for writing and finishing your dissertation. That was, that was his article. So now I want to get into my 10 tips for revision. Uh, before that, a Snoopy's cartoon. Snoopy's uh, writing, it was a dark and stormy, stormy night. And um, Charles Charlie Brown comes and says, uh, your novel is very, has a very exciting beginning. He says, thank you. And he write, sends it back, says, good luck with the second sentence. Now that's <laughs> often how we feel in writing a research paper. You know, <laughs> we have our abstract and then we have to go and start writing the article for tech trends. And it's not easy. It's never easy. Um, there's all sorts of things to keep in mind, but here's my 10, top 10 revision tips for writing a, for a dissertation. Number one, when, a, when a, your committee says that you have to make certain changes, you say yes. <laughs> you might not make them all, but you at least make them think like you made them all. So you say yes, though, that's a great idea. You always start with a positive response. It's, if Tech Trends sends you feedback, Tina and Heijong, you, you say, oh, that was a, thank you very much for making that point. This is what we did. Uh, we appreciate that point. You always start with something, you don't repeat what you said previously. So you might say thank you a couple of times, just say, well, that was really insightful, or that was an excellent point, or we hadn't thought of that. And the same is true of your dissertation. You know, these are really excellent examples that will improve my dissertation. Now, you don't have to make all their changes. You just start off by saying positive things. And then if you make 80% of the suggested changes, normally if you make 80% to 85, you don't have to make the other 10 to 15%. This is Bonk's rule, 80-20 rule, okay? Or 85-15% rule. If you make 80% of the changes, oftentimes you don't have to make the other 20%. Oftentimes. I didn't say all the time, oftentimes, Okay. So keep that in mind if you have a really hard change to make and you don't know how you're going to make it, often you can work around that and say, all you, if, you've, if you've elaborated on all the changes you've made and you had a couple things that you can't do, you just kind of say, well, that was a really good point. Uh, we changed that sentence around a little bit and you can just rewrite the sentences <laughs> and maybe add one more reference. You know, oftentimes you can find another reference. You still might not have it responded fully to the reviewers, but you've added a reference. You've changed a couple of sentences. Oh, that's good enough. If you've made 80% of the changes, a couple of them, you just massage it a little bit and you tell them you, you, you and it makes it sound, oh, that's pretty good. Now, the other way you can go about it is to say, we've changed all that but we'd like some more help and some insight into these last two changes. Can you give me some more structure? Tell me what exact, you know, a little more guidance and, and what you're expecting from these last two changes. We made, we made the 15 changes the committee wanted. I made the 15 changes the committee wanted. Two of them I was really unsure about, and I would really appreciate getting a little more help, maybe some references or something like that. And that's okay. So you start with, a, again, 
you start with taking initiative. If you take initiative, if you go on the front end and just say, oh, I disagree with my committee. How could they come up with, did they really read my dissertation? How could they have said that? They 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 passed me at the dissertation defense, I mean, proposal. They, they, they agreed at the proposal. Why are they making the, this issue up now when they already, well, don't stop. Even if they agreed to something at the proposal stage and they changed their mind later, you know, most things. So actually, let me back up. The most important date is not your dissertation defense. It's dis your dissertation proposal defense, because that becomes a contract with your committee of what you're going to do. Your proposal in many ways is more important. Once you pass your proposal, once you pass the proposal and have a data source, if a sample, a population, and have data from that population, you could take a few years to finish, but you will finish more than likely. Once you once they agree to it and you have the data and you have the population, it may take you a while to analyze and organize and all these other things, but that's you're you're ninety percent of the way there. You just have to write the last four chapter four and chapter five, which is not as not as hard as you would think. The first three chapters are, I think, are much harder to write than the last two chapters or last three or last four. And some people write a dissertation as a book, and they might have ten chapters, and they might try and publish it as a book. Not often. Sometimes they do. Change sometimes has a yellow streak to it. So sometimes on the committee, I will. I like the. Tina's dissertation. I really liked it a lot, but Dr. Brush is, is that Dr. Brush your advisor, Tina? Dr. L? Yeah. So Dr. L might um, say, you know, who wants to read Tina's dissertation again? Um, you've all passed her with revisions. Who wants to read another version after the defense? And I'll always raise my hand. I want to read, but not the whole thing. I want to read what changed. So if you made changes in your dissertation, you can highlight them in yellow or green, some kind of color, so that I know those are the new parts, because I'll find, edit, I'll edit that part, okay? You've made it easier for me by yellow highlighting. The same is true when Tina works on an article with Hei Zhang. The, the first couple, you, tr you track changes, annotations and all this. Maybe in the last version, Tina's just made a few changes. She highlights in yellow the changes. If Hei Zhang agrees with them, we just, delete the yellows. So it's a last step is putting yellow highlights in the changes. Put everything in a revisionary table. So as I said, here's the reviewers and what they want, my committee members and what they want. This is a this is what I did. This is how I changed it and these are the page numbers you'll find it on. This is the first item, the second item, the third item. So create a revisionary table. I showed you last week in Dropbox. There is there are examples of this exact thing. There are like 10 examples of papers I've written, revised in the past two years. The revisionary tables are there of what we sent to the journals. So you have, you have a lot of examples or guidance in this regard. Maybe I'll go back to Dropbox when I get through this if we have a few minutes. Hold a, a personal peer review. Find a, a colleague to edit your, to give you feedback, to, Edit your papers to, to um, assume the role of a reviewer. If you have a friend, <laughs> if you have a, hopefully you have lots of friends that you could send your paper, your proposal, your dissertation to, and get some peer feedback on it. Don't start tomorrow. If you say you're going to start tomorrow, then tomorrow becomes tomorrow, and tomorrow's tomorrow becomes tomorrow. And it continues. You can always, there's always a tomorrow. There's, but there's nothing like, getting started today. You, your procrastination will never go away if you if you keep trying to start tomorrow. So you have to take action uh, on uh, every day of the year, 365 days. Um, one of my quotes in my calendar is 365 days does not make a year, but taking action each day will. And the same is true of your dissertation. Write a letter to your committee. Here's, I. so one thing we want is a revisionary table. The second thing we want is a letter to us saying, here's what I heard at the dissertation defense or the proposal defense, and these are the areas I'm gonna focus on in my changes. So it's 
you know, your advisor will, will talk to you about this. And basically, it's a short summary of what you learned. So we want to make sure you understood what we were advising you to do. Sometimes a faculty member is confusing. <laughs> Sometimes the student response to the faculty member is confusing. And me, as a third member sitting there, well, the student doesn't make any sense. My colleague here doesn't quite make total sense either. Let's just get it on paper and get everyone to agree on it, okay? Um, so that they're not, you know, so they're they're not talking over the top of each other. So you're forming an agreeable agreement. So your advisor will go through this with you at the end of the proposal meeting, at the end of your dissertation defense. Your advisor will stay in the room with you if it's a face-to-face -face meeting. He will stay. He or she will stay in Zoom with you if it's an online meeting, and they'll form an agreeable agreement, um, marking down what things you're going to change. Number eight, make a checklist and check it. <laughs> Just like Santa Claus has a checklist and he checks it twice, going to find out who's naughty or nice. You're going to create a checklist for your dissertation revisions, and that will go a long ways in making sure that you do everything that's in there. So on the back, every day I've got dates in my cal calendar, someone else's calendar, and on the back I'll write a checklist of things I got to do today or tomorrow or for this paper, and make sure you have plenty of ice cream. So uh, those of you in Bloomington, maybe we can have a meetup at Chocolate Moose during the semester at some point and have ice cream when maybe when we finish week 15 in here. Um, we got enough Bloomington people, plus Tina's nearby. I don't know if any other EDD students are really close enough by, but you might come down, who knows. Um, and then send out thank yous to people if you want. This is not required. This, not everybody does, to be honest, but some do, and it's it won't help you pass your dissertation, but it will help you be form a relationship with your advising committee for when you leave, you know, to be a colleague uh, later on in life. Now, 10 tips, finally, 10 tips for dissertation defense. Okay. Uh, number one, the eyes have it. Now, this is also good for dossier two, by the way, Hijong and Tofik and uh, Jake. Uh, at at your your um, your dis your dossier too. When someone asks you a question, look right at them and then pan the audience. Look around the whole audience and talk to everybody. Don't look away. Don't look down. And and yeah, and you know, make some eye contact. Maybe restate what their question was if you didn't quite get it, and it gives you more time to think if you restate their question. And don't just look at the person. Please don't just look at the person that asks questions. Look at everybody. After you first make eye contact with the person asking, then pan around and then come back to the person right at the end of answering the question so you're answering them again. You've basically answered that person twice, and you've answered the whole audience at least once. They've all seen you. They all heard from you. Believe in the power of food. Now, increasingly, I'm seeing the food be nourishing, substantive, kinds of food like berries, like uh, strawberries, raspberries, which I eat every day, carrots and celery. Now, carrots and celery are too hard. I love carrots and celery, I eat them all. But for a dissertation defense, it's kind of distracting to, to hear the <coughs> get berries. Can people can chew on berries or a little string cheese and bread? You know, that's that's okay too. Um, now, whatever you whatever you decide you want to bring with is, is fine. Um, you could just bring orange juice if you want, or bottles of water if you want. That's fine, but bring something. I would recommend bring something. The power of movement. Don't move too much, but move somewhat. Okay, so you know you can you can pan over to this side of the room, pan over to that side of the room a little bit, but you want to be somewhat stationary and looking at your audience in front of you. And so you can move a bit, but don't like run across, you know, your, <laughs> and don't constantly be moving. Move sometimes. I recommend you move maybe towards the person asking a question, right? Don't move away from the person asking a question, you know, and then go into their directions. Make Maybe make two steps, three steps towards that person, and then move back two or three steps. But don't just... If you go back and forth and back and forth, they, they, they see this nervous tension, okay? 
So that means you have to practice a little bit. Uh, be willing to accept handouts and give them out too. <laughs> Increasingly, we see people putting things on the web. When you're at a dissertation defense, it does us no good to have the reference be on the internet because normally we don't have a computer open during the defense. Have a handout. There's paper is still valuable for something. A one-page handout is, I think, is extremely valuable, like a summary of points that you're trying to make. Or many students put their powerpoints as handouts, as six to six slides to a page. I like that. Some do three slides to a page and then have the slides slides for question asking on the right hand side and have the slides on the left hand side. That's useful too. I'd either do three per page or six per page. My preference is six per page because then we have less pages, but probably most faculty would prefer three per page. So you have to decide, okay? Does that make sense? Something like that. But then, you know, um, you might have other kinds of handouts, you know, some um, maybe summary lists or some, you know, definitions of terms, maybe a glossary of words. You know, glossaries are wonderful in dissertations. When you're using all these technical, when you have all these acronyms, having a summary appendix with the terms in them is extremely valuable. And you might have a handout related to that, whatever it is. And then practice with, with an adult or a child in the room. Now, <clears throat> when I say practice your 15 or 20 minute presentation, I'm not saying practice once. <laughs> I'm saying practice three times, practice four times, practice twice. Don't just practice once because once you'll be terrible. Your first, first time I present anything, I'm terrible at presenting. But the second time you see a change that's happening after maybe the audience member has asked you questions, one or two audience members, maybe three. Some people have a, a group they like, but at least one person, maybe your advisor becomes the audience. If, it's a, if you're an online student, maybe it's in Zoom, you know, practice in Zoom, whatever. Um, and then practice a second time and you'll see a tremendous change in you. Practice till your brain hates you, <laughs> if you want. You don't have to, but I recommend practicing till your brain hates you because the next day when you actually have to present in front of your, peer, your uh, committee, you'll feel much more relaxed. Your brain was mad at you yesterday. Today, your brain only has to do it once. You've, you've done the hard part already. You did the hard part during practice. Now it's easy. You're just, you, may, you wanna make preparation the hard thing, not the defense, right? You wanna, you wanna as plan as many things as possible. And then don't talk to the screen. And don't look like this. My dissertation is on, my dissertation, always looking backwards. Now, it's okay to look back. In fact, it's really good to look back and point to the screen once, twice, three, four times, that's it. But if you're presenting for 15 minutes and you spend 15 minutes looking back at the screen behind you, you really look dumb. You really look unprepared. You really look nervous. You really don't, um, you're not engaging the audience. And so, you, you want to look back, and especially if there's some really key acronym or something. Oh, as shown in slide number two, you'll see you know this acronym or this whatever, this data point. That's okay. You're helping the audience. You want to use the screen and pointing to it to help the audience. You don't want the screen to be you. You don't want your ideas to be only on the screen and not in your head. You want the audience, the faculty members, to, to understand that these are your ideas and you know this topic inside and out. You know this extremely well. So practice your dissertation with a closed screen or turn the monitor around to the other way so you can't see it or probably the best way, the easiest way, the number one way that I recommend is moving 10 feet back from the screen so you can barely read what's on the screen in front of you so that you almost have to memorize it, but you can cheat a little bit because you can see it, okay? So I would recommend just moving the, the computer away from you as far as you can, but you can still see a little bit of it and then give your presentation. And then when you have to give your presentation, it's only three feet in front of you or one foot, you'll feel much more comfortable, okay? Does that make sense? Yeah.
So I like the close the screen thing. It, you know, you see if see what you remember. Um, don't assume anything. Send your committee a reminder of the defense. I've been on 120 some. I've only missed one, and it was two months ago or three or four months ago. I missed my first one. The student didn't send a reminder. I was actually the one that had set it up in the Zoom ske Outlook schedules, but I don't check my Outlook schedule. I don't like digital schedules dictating what I'm going to do every minute of the day. So I, don't, I really don't. I don't like relying on on Outlook for my calendar because if I if I'm going to be stuck with an Outlook calendar, I become an automaton. I'm a robot. I don't want to be a robot, <laughs> and so. Um, I, I don't want to be hand tied to everyone scheduling things for me. I, I hate schedules. In fact, if you have a if you're a, if you're a one of my advisees and you have an issue on your dissertation, I want you to call me right away and I'll answer it. I don't want to have a meeting two days from now. Through. I want to solve it right now. That's my goal. My goal is to solve things. It's eleven o'clock at night. We'll solve it at eleven o'clock at night. I don't want something on my calendar because if it goes on my calendar, that takes away my writing time. Well, the same true as your dissertation. People, you know, faculty are are writing. We're doing this. We're doing that. If you don't send an email reminder or a text, a text message reminder or something else, you know, don't trust Outlook Calendar. I found that out three months ago. Don't trust it to be the only thing. It can help, but don't have it be the only thing. Send reminders, a, a, a kind reminder to everyone. Invite your friends. If you have good people and friends in the room, you'll you'll smile, you'll feel more comfortable, feel more relaxed. Some of you don't want your friends there. And I understand that some people feel more pressure when their friends are there. Some people bring their spouse or their children or their mother. A couple of people have brought their mothers with them, the grandparents. That's okay. That's great. That's fine. I recently had a student, well, Therese from uh, Grenada. Um, her husband came up with her uh, and sat in. Uh, that was great. Number 10, pre-plan a celebration, you know, a party. You should have a party when you finish, of course. And we all want to party at some point in time. So plan it out. Go to wherever, you know, do that. So um, I will I think I'll stop there. What will you do? <laughs> what will you do? What are your writing plans for the next month, next year, and so forth? I'll stop at that point. Um, questions for me. Was that helpful? We covered a lot of territory tonight with a lot of tips from, from um, qualifying exams to proposals to defenses to rewriting. The A to Z was tonight in some ways, right? So any comments, anything that, how about, how about in the chat window, instead of what's your next writing, how about one thing that you caught from my presentation that you can use? What's one idea that resonated with you? Yeah, an organized, um, like a flow chart, you know, um, um, a macro structure, and then the to-do list, all these organizational aids, you know, are really important for, for human learning is enhanced by organizational aids and, and strategies and so forth. Uh, handouts also give you some psychological safety that you've given everyone something. Your defense is part of an event. The handouts are part of it. The food is part of it. Your presentation is part of it. So it takes away the emphasis on just your presentation. So if you mess up a little bit, it's okay. They got a handout, you know, <laughs> they got a handout. Um, working uh, change request spreadsheet reminds me a lot uh, of what we use for big documents. Yeah. Tina, you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Oh, um. So when I was doing a lot of um, systems engineering and um, test master plans and all that jazz, we had to work with other warfare centers um, across the United States. Right. So, um, you know, I would write a big test master plan and um, everybody and their brother would 
ping on it and say, you know, paragraph 3.1.2.1 change, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. And then I would have to go change made, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But it was, Roger it was that. <laughs> What's that? It was a good tracker. Yeah. Roger that in the military. They say, Roger right. that. <laughs> Okay, and pay a proofreader, Paula says. You know, again, it's about support. No one else does your dissertation, but people can help just by attending it. You want to create an ambiance, a positive ambiance uh, for that dissertation and the defense. Um, yeah, presentation is the top topic. Yeah, this will help you in dossier too. All those tips I gave you, Hejong. Um, and others that might be getting ready for dossier two, you know, that those tips, if, if you utilize them, that will change. I, 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 I can't guarantee it, but it has my seal of approval. <laughs> Eye contact, don't overlooking at the board. You know, you can look back. You look more smart if you do once in a while, if you know exactly where you're going to, when you're going to turn back and just say, Oh, by the way, on this slide here, you'll see I pointed to X, Y, Z. Instead of reading from their slide, you're telling them why the slide exists. And that's a big difference, right? If you're just looking at the slide and reading definitions to people, they'll get bored and fall asleep. You don't want that, you know? Tina, you have a hand raised, I think? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, um, again, at work, we were all, we, we had to go through um, lots of communication kind of classes and how to make effective presentations and all that kind of jazz. Um, but one thing that always stuck with me and people still do it and it drives me nuts is that they make their presentations an eye chart, like they shove all these words on it and you really should not do that um, because <laughs> then you're like reading the chart, like you said, you shouldn't. Um, so there's a lot of good um, YouTube tutorials on how to make effective presentations so it sticks in your brain and, right. and it isn't putting 500 words on a presentation. Right, there's exceptions to the rule, but for the most part, you don't jam up all sorts of words. Sometimes you have quotes from your participants, but you can make that multiple slides. Sometimes you have an analysis scheme, your coding scheme. You want to briefly put the coding scheme up just to make people aware of it, but then you don't leave it up for too long. Just to say, you know, these were the codes that I use just to remind you of it. I'm not going to read from it, you know, that. So there's a couple, and then have the reference list at the end. You might have a screen that has lots of references. To, so, you know, a rule for not having it too much on a screen. It's not a cut and dry rule. It's 90% of the time, not you don't want, but 10% of the time is okay to have a squishy text and all that, or 5% or 2% of that have squishy text, but not often. So yeah. Um, any last comments? Sunmei, do you have any comment before we close tonight? Not really. Anyone want to make a final statement to end week two for us? No? Okay, then I will say it's been a pleasure having all of you with us for week two, our 795. And I will be making a YouTube as well as putting this in Kaltura Media Files in Can Canvas. And so if you want to re watch this later on, this will be made available uh, for you. And next week, again, we'll have a panel. If there's a, so those top 10 lists of dissertation offenses, and presentations and revisions. If you'd like me to do another type of ten, top 10 list, send me a topic and I'll create a top 10 list. Whatever the topic is, you know, um, if it's ethics and doing research, I could create a top 10 ethics rules or something like that. But those, you know, um, those are the ones that I, I, from my experience, tend to be important. Uh, revising and presenting tend to be really important for people. So again, thanks for coming in week two. I'll stop the recording at this point. And it's